Okay, well, it is noon. Um, welcome everyone to one of our hot talks this afternoon. My name is Carrie Burns. I'm director of CLE here at the Bar Association. So this is not a CLE today, but this is um, one of our um, discussions as part of our hot talk series. These are supposed to be um, ripped from the headline discussions about potentially um, dicey topics. Um, although this one today, I feel like all our panelists are, are a little bit of the same opinion, which is still good. And it still gives us some great discussion about um, transplant patients and, and COVID vaccines. Um, we are partnering today with the um, Academy of Medicine of Northeast Ohio, um, and we really appreciate their support and time. Um, we are regular partners for our annual medical legal summit, which typically takes place in the spring. Um, so happy to have them here today, um, but let's get into it. I want to introduce our panel for everyone today. First, we have Dr. Kristen England. She is an infectious disease expert and the current president of the Academy. Um, so we're happy to have her here today to talk. Um, second, we have Professor Sharona Hoffman. She is at Case Western Reserve University. Um, she is the Edgar A. Hahn Professor of Law, Professor of Bioethics, and co-director of the Law School's Law Medicine Center. She teaches health law courses, employment discrimination, and Civ Pro, and she was voted first year teacher of the year in 2011, 2012, and 2019. Um, and then finally today, our moderator is Brad Reed. He is the chair of our healthcare law section here at the Bar Association and a partner at Franz Ward. He works on a wide range of corporate, transactional, regulatory, data privacy, cybersecurity, employee benefits matters. Specifically, he, his practice focuses on working with hospitals, physicians, and other healthcare providers regarding complex regulatory and compliance issues. Um, and for today, Brad is going to moderate. We do um, want to hear from the audience and hear questions. So please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen um, for those of you on Zoom. For those of you on Facebook, if you want to put it in the chat, we will get it to Brad and our panelists today. And with that, Brad, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks, Carrie. And uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, appreciate you all uh, uh, taking the time out of your, your afternoon and, and joining us. Um, and yeah, as, as Carrie said, I think, you know, the, um, you know, the hot top talk series, right, uh, sometimes deals with, I think, some thorny and controversial uh, legal issues. And we definitely have, a, you know, controversy here, but I think ultimately we're going to hear that the uh, medical and legal issues surrounding it are um, maybe not so uh, uh, gray as, as uh, one might think, but, uh, you know, we wanted to, to bring this today because this is a the recently um, health systems in Cleveland and, and throughout the country have started adopting um, vaccine mandates for transplant patients, and which has generated a, a, a sig significant amount of, of media coverage. And we're hoping to um, you know provide some of the the background and, and answers around the, the medical and, and legal justifications. Um, you know, for such a for such a mandate, and to help the the CMBA and the Academy's membership, um, you know, better understand those factors uh, for those decisions beyond just what's you know covered in a, a in a short article. So, um, first, I, I want to turn it over to, to Dr. England to just give a uh, uh, overview of the um, transplant patient uh, vaccination mandates that are, that are being adopted, and and really the. Uh, medical reasoning um, supporting those those mandates. Dr. England? Thank everybody for joining us today. <laughs> this is going to be a, a very important and, and topical topic, but understanding that most of us who are on the call today are neither transplant surgeons nor transplant patients, I really think it's a, an important basis for understanding what what is all involved in evaluation of transplant patients and the life of a transplant patient as well. And then, and then that will help us turn to our expert on, um, on healthcare law. So the US is on pace this year to top 40,000 organ transplants in a single year. So COVID-19, while it slowed down some of the transplants, uh, we have caught back up uh, pretty quickly. So we're still on target for, for getting one of the largest transplant years. So there's almost 107,000 people who are in need of organ transplants at any one time. 
64,000 of those are active on the list, but almost 40% are inactive for many reasons, including medical noncompliance, which we're going to talk about in, in just a little bit. Unfortunately, 20 people every day die on average because an organ is not available in time for them to get a transplant. So there's a tremendous need that is not being met by the organs that are available. And less than 1% of all deaths in the United States meet the specific medical criteria to be a donor. So even though we have lots of folks unfortunately dying, only 1% of them are able to actually be used for donations. So we don't really wanna squander our very scarce resources and patients must be fully vetted before they can move forward in the organ transplant. Now we talk about SARS-CoV-2. So across the world, we just unfortunately passed the 5 million death mark. So 5 million people have died over the last almost two years of, of COVID. In Ohio, it's 25,000 Ohioans have already died from COVID. And only 51% of Ohioans are fully vaccinated at this time. So let's talk specifically about patients who need transplants and their, their underlying health issues. So usually they have pretty severe medical illnesses that have led them to needing a transplant of some sort, whether it be diabetes, high blood pressure, smoking, which has caused other vascular uh, disease processes throughout their whole body, high cholesterol causing vascular plaques in not only the heart, but all other organs, liver cirrhosis, things such as lupus, but rarely is it an acute event in an otherwise healthy person. So these patients already have a lot of underlying illnesses that aren't going to go away with the transplant um, and that also put them at risk for severe COVID infection. So pre-transplant evaluation is, is very rigorous. Patients have to make numerous medical appointments. They have to get blood work. They have to optimize their medication to make sure their diabetes and their high blood pressure is under control. They need vaccinations for things such as hepatitis and influenza. They have to go on, undergo uh, social work evaluation and also see, seek with psychologists as well to make sure that they're emotionally ready to go through the rigors of a transplant. So medical compliance can be a real issue that we need to make sure that patients can do because once they get an organ that's only the start of their life with a new organ. They have a lot of uh, requirements that they're going to have to go through after the organ. It's not an easy process. We also require patients to stop smoking, stop drinking, and they can't use any drugs. They have to have social support in place because they have to have somebody who can help bring them to appointments um, and help to care for them afterwards. And after transplant, they're on lifelong immunosuppressive medications, months of antibiotics to help prevent them from getting infections and antivirals, numerous medical visits, and patients can't pick and choose what they want to be using from these anti-rejection medications and these antibiotics and antivirals. It's all part of a very clearly prescribed and, and carefully crafted plan of care to help optimize these patients so that they will succeed. Just to talk very briefly about transplant patients and how they do with COVID, studies have shown that kidney transplant patients who required hospitalization, so they were sick enough to be hospitalized, had a mortality rate of almost 30%, and another 12% lost their graft. The general mortality rate for unvaccinated patients is about 1.6%, so this was dramatically different. So while Numbers will vary by, by country and by organ. We can certainly see that the immunosuppression that these patients undergo and their underlying health issues can put them significantly at risk for death and losing an organ. SARS-CoV can also infect any number of cells throughout the entire body because there are the ACE2 receptors in the heart, in the lungs, in the kidneys, in the GI tract, and all of these can have a wide variety of, of symptoms in patients. There are reports of donors uh, with SARS-CoV-2 transmitting their, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 to recipients um, who received their organs and after a uh, donor lung transplant, after the recipient died from SARS-CoV-2, that's when a lot of these organizations started coming out with regulations 
um, requiring or at least strongly suggesting that, that donors be uh, vaccinated as, as well as recipients. So even if patients um, don't necessarily die from their COVID, they can have a lot of uh, medical issues within the, within the hospital. Our best medications to treat COVID um, have potential liver toxicities like remdesivir and tocilizumab. So if somebody had a liver transplant and, and now we have to use potentially hepatotoxic medications on them, that's a real challenge. We need to prevent the disease in and of itself. So the American Society of Transplantation has recommended that all transplant candidates and their household contacts receive COVID vaccine at least two weeks prior to transplantation. The, the response to the, to the vaccine is much better pre-transplant than it is post-transplant because we do put patients on significant immunosuppressive medications so they don't reject their organs, but at the same time, they're not gonna respond very well to the vaccination after they've had their transplant. Right now, more than 250 organ transplant centers are requiring COVID vaccination. And the expectation is that that, that number will climb pretty significantly. Transplant centers are evaluated by their success of their transplant patients and at the, the one year survival of their patients, but even far more than that, the medical teams are very emotionally invested in these patients. They spend a lot of time with them and to see them die from something so unnecessary as COVID is tragic all around. So that's my push for it at this point in time. I'd love to hear others' opinions and, and certainly from our, our other guest, uh, Professor Hoffman. Thank you, Dr. England. And it, so it, I think it, it, to me, one of, I guess, one of the, the takeaways there is that the medical requirements, the, the pre-screening, everything that a transplant patient is going through to be approved the COVID vaccine mandate is really a kind of a, a small part of that and in line with pretty much all of the other medical requirements they would have been and medical compliance needs that, that would have been imposed at the start. Absolutely. The goal of the pre-transplant evaluation is to make sure that we are selecting the patients who are going to be a most in need, but also the most successful. We want to make sure that if the whole system is going through the process of transplanting an organ into a patient, we've optimized their health the best that we can mm -hmm. so that they will succeed and survive the organ transplant process. And I think the other maybe um, takeaway, or at least at least that raises the, the, the point that this is very different from your average patient going into a, a hospital or a health system, right? I mean, these, the, 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 patient, the, the transplant patient mandate is not, um, it was really not, we're not evaluating the same factors that you might say, you know, about somebody who's just going in for an outpatient procedure. I mean, it's just a completely different world. Well, absolutely. So this does not mean that every patient needs to get it, but if you're going through the process of an organ transplantation, something that serious and something that basically lifelong, um, you know, we, we need to make sure that we're giving you, you know, optimizing your insulin so that making sure that your diabetes is well controlled. And, and if you can't optimize your diabetes, then you're not going to be a good candidate for being able to keep your diabetes under control after you get a transplant. So by the same token, if you're at risk for COVID and you're not, and you're not, um, taking care of that issue, you're, you're not going to be able to to keep from getting COVID, less likely to keep from getting COVID post-transplant. So we're trying to optimize every aspect of a patient's health, overall health, to have them be successful. And the COVID vaccine is simply a small part of it, but you know, obviously it's a it's a hot topic right now, which is why mm -hmm. we're talking about right. it. But in in the grand scheme of things, in optimizing a patient for transplant, it's a very small part of it. Thank you. Uh, turning to, to Professor Hoffman, um, you know, so now that we've, you know, kind of understanding the, the, the medical reasoning and justification for the, for requiring um, vaccines for transplant patients, uh, 
you know, what, what are the, what are the, what's the legal background? Where, where is, uh, do the courts and, and law stand on, on, you know, the, the enforcement and adoption of such mandates? Right. So I think in the case of transplants, as Dr. England so clearly explained, it's sort of a no brainer. It's no different from any of the other dozens of requirements um, that are in place in order to make sure that the transplant is as successful as possible. So it's, it's a very small part of what a patient has to do. Um, and it comes along with other vaccines and psychological tests and anti-rejection drugs throughout life. And I think there really isn't a legal question about whether or not this is valid. Um, but there are a lot of objections to vaccines in general and to the COVID vaccine in particular. However, the law has long established that these types of vaccine mandates are legal. So back in 1905, there was a Supreme Court case called Jacobson versus Massachusetts, in which the city of Cambridge established a vaccine mandate for smallpox, which was a horrible disease with a high mortality rate. Um, and somebody challenged it and said it violates his constitutional rights. And the Supreme Court said it does not violate his constitutional rights unless it would cause him personally to have a severe medical problem. So states have the right to establish vaccine mandates for the purpose of promoting public health. And that has been established for over a century by the Supreme Court. Similarly, private institutions have the ability to establish vaccine mandates um, unless that is discriminatory in some way, unless they are forcing people to get a vaccine even though that is going to hurt their health, unless they are you know, discriminating by race or sex or age in some way in terms of the vaccine mandate. Uh, and in many cases, there's also a religious exemption for people that have a bona fide religious belief, though I believe there's a case questioning that up at the Supreme Court that will soon be heard. Um, so vaccine mandates are a traditional way of promoting public health, and they are not questionable under the law. There isn't a constitutional um, objection that is valid to it. And while you do have autonomy, you have the right to reject treatment such as chemotherapy or a ventilator or artificial nutrition and hydration. You have that right so long as your health is the only thing at stake. And that is a constitutional right. But you don't have a right if others' health is at stake. So we have no smoking mandates now in different places because we understand the dangers of secondhand smoke. And we don't have protests about that. Everybody accepts that, though I'm sure there are smokers who would love to be able to smoke everywhere. And you don't have the right to consume alcohol and then get in a car and drive because that is a danger to others even though it's you consuming alcohol yourself. And so in the same way, you can't have an objection to getting a vaccine because you're not only endangering your own health, which you might have a right to do, but in the case of a vaccine, you are endangering the health of many, many others, including children who up until now have not been able to be vaccinated. And in the case of transplants, uh, first of all, if you're in the hospital with COVID, you're obviously exposing other people who are vulnerable or who are healthcare providers. But also, since we have such a scarcity of organs, we have to make sure that whoever gets this precious resource of an organ has the best chance to succeed. Uh, and getting a COVID-19 vaccine is, is a part of that. So I will stop there since I know we have limited time. Great, thank you, Professor Hoffman. And, and I guess one just follow up on that, right? I mean, those are the, 
uh, the case law on this, you know, dating back to, you know, the, the, the turn of the last century, right? Have you seen or aware of any, I, I know the main, that main case is up to, you know, being considered by the Supreme Court now, but have there been any indications of courts sort of questioning that, you know, that basic kind of, you know, underlying assumption about public health uh, um, mandates and, 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 you know, are, are we really seeing, seeing anybody try to change that paradigm, at least from a, a, a court perspective? Right, so at the end of October, the um, Supreme Court did deny a request to block uh, Maine's healthcare worker COVID vaccine mandate. So that mandate was upheld for healthcare workers in Maine. Um, there may be some local courts with judges that have political agendas that have uh, ruled against, I think, mask mandates. Um, but those are few and far between. Uh, when it comes to constitutional arguments, there's really not a strong constitutional argument for rejecting vaccine mandates other than for people who, whose own health would be um, endangered by the vaccine and, and a little bit more questionable are religious objections. Thank you. Yeah, um, well, I, you know, I, it's, a, it's a short session today and I see we, have a, we do have a question. So um, we'll take that question. And if there are any other questions, you know, please do feel free to put them in the, in the Q&A. Um, but the question is, it, you know, uh, if organs uh, were available, you know, for transplant were readily available instead of scarce, would the picture change? Is, are some of the detailed protocols and requirements that are aimed at maximizing transplant success, um, including COVID-19 vaccination, driven by the desire to not waste uh, a, a scarce, a very scarce resource? So that's a really good question. I think it would certainly help if we had a lot more organs that were available, but I do still think that Overall, the patients would still undergo pretty rigid um, evaluations uh, to make sure that they can that they can um, survive and thrive with their organs. Because again, this is a lifelong commitment for these patients uh, to be able to undergo it. You you once once an organ transplant patient, your life is different. Uh, you do have to stay on these immunosuppressants for the rest of your life and, and often antibiotics to make sure that they're controlled so or that you don't get other infections. So it, it's, it's still something and, you know, gosh, people get evaluated uh, and, and, and not on the transplant list because of their age, because of their underlying medical illnesses that they wouldn't survive the transplant. So I don't think I, I Hey, I want everybody to, to donate their organs. I think we, we should have a much stronger push for people to donate organs. I wish we had enough for everybody who wanted one. Um, but I do still think that the protocols that are put in place at this point in, point in time are to ensure the best outcome for transplant patients, not only just to weed them out from, from those who can't comply, but really to make sure that people survive and thrive. Thanks, Dr. England. Um, I, happy to take additional questions. Um, I, I think, you know, in the meantime, uh, one from a legal standpoint and from a from a medical practice standpoint, right? Obviously, this this has come up as a result of the the um, transplant patient uh, mandate that that we're seeing. Uh, but I wonder, you know, could a individual, you know, uh, physician's practice, right? Possibly one that has similar um, high-risk patients, right? Not necessarily transplant, but other, you know, dealing with, with you know, patients who are immunocompromised or, or other risk. Um, could they put in a, a, some sort of vaccine, you know, requirement if they, if they wanted to? And, and I guess, it, you know, if, if that's feasible, um, are you aware of any practices doing so? So from a legal perspective, 
they certainly could. I mean, we saw most healthcare uh, practices put in a mask mandate uh, and not everybody liked that. But again, that is for the sake of protecting other patients and healthcare workers. This is an infectious disease. Um, and so it would be legal for the medical practice to also say we want a proof of vaccine. Theaters are doing that. Some restaurants have done that. Um, employers are doing it. So there's absolutely no reason why healthcare providers couldn't do it. And of course, patients would have a choice depending on their insurance provider um, to try to find a different practice. So I don't think there's a legal problem with that. And I'll ask Dr. England if she is aware of any practices actually doing that. You know, I certainly heard of pediatric practices that have um, put those uh, mandates in play. I mean, but it but it's even separate from the the COVID vaccine. I mean, there were discussions about this uh, regarding measles vaccinations for you know for patients who refuse all kinds of vaccinations for their children, um, and and certainly the concerns of other patients. Uh, going to that practice because they don't want to have a febrile child next to them who potentially has measles or chicken pox or something else that can be spread to their uh, to their compromised child. So uh, this is a conversation again that has been had prior to COVID and will continue beyond. But uh, I do think that uh, practices, especially those that um, uh, service more patients who are compromised uh, absolutely have the right to be able to uh, protect their patients um, who uh, um, who are who are at risk for getting uh, some pretty severe complications from infections. Thank you. Yeah, I, I the um, I think the the the. It's an important point, uh, Dr. England, that this is not a necessarily a new conversation, and and in fact, in the in the pediatrics world, that you know, been having um, uh, physicians and, and parents have been dealing um, with these issues about um, uh, you know uh, uh, patients and and unvaccinated patients in the in the office, and so you know we're it's something that has only become more I, I think. Uh, that we're becoming aware of, but in many ways, this is, you know, healthcare providers have been, have been having to think through and deal with these issues, um, you know, for a while. Uh, see another question. Uh, 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 this is regarding the, uh, the case, the Supreme Court case um, uh, mentioned by Professor Hoffman, um, if we have the case name or citation um, regarding the religious exemption, and I believe it's a it was the religious exemption at issue there was relating to healthcare, uh, a healthcare employee mandate, not a not a patient mandate. Um, but uh, Dr. Hoffman can uh, can yeah. Um, so I believe it's um, John Doe versus Janet T. Mills in her official capacity as governor of the state of Maine. Um, so it's, uh, it's the main case and one of the issues is a religious exemption. So, and it's, yeah, it's not about transplant patients or any patients at all. Uh, and then a, uh, a note here in the chat, uh, the uh, ADA uh, is taking the position that dentists may not refuse care to unvaccinated patients, um, which I had not, not uh, heard yet, but that's, that's an interesting, um, I don't know if either of you have, have a reaction to that as far as, um, I mean, that's certainly, uh, you know, the, uh, the, you know, the, the association's position, but not necessarily a, uh, a legal requirement. Well, I think whenever I go to the dentist, they're certainly always using masks and shields uh, whenever I'm getting them uh, working on me specifically. Uh, 
until COVID, uh, we have not been doing that. So we don't use universal masks and, and shields when we see patients. If that becomes the norm, then there's less of a risk of a transmission of chickenpox and measles and, 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 other, vac and, and other vaccine present preventable diseases like SARS-CoV-2. But um, at, at least you know, the statement from, from previous from the American Dental Association probably dealt with the fact that their, their providers are, are routinely wearing uh, protective equipment anyway. All right. Well, um, thank you uh, both to, to Dr. England and, and uh, Professor Hoffman for their for their time. And we're we're at the half hour mark. Um, so just wanted to to close by thank you to CMBA and the and the Academy of Medicine for for hosting. Um, and you know I think this was an issue that that was interesting to us because it has generated a, a lot of of media coverage and and reaction. Um, but I think the you know the the takeaway for, for me is that ultimately it is not a it is not a legal or medical uh, controversy or, or hot topic and and that you know uh, our members can can you know hopefully have a better sense of of um, that this is something that really has has a has strong medical and legal justifications and support and and is um, less really not a <laughs> you know often it's we don't get answers that are sort of as clear cut and uh, and I think obvious is this in these topics or as as where there's agreement as much on these topics um, but you know that doesn't mean that it's not of relevance to the to physicians and lawyers to understand that that is not the conversation necessarily being had in in the public. Um, and so knowing where you know where the 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 bar or where you know where the, the law and medical justifications are on it. Um, and then, yes, and then uh, just a note in the, in the Q&A um, to, to thank our panel for a, a, a great presentation. So thank you for sharing that. And um, with that, I'll, I will turn it back over to, the, um, to Carrie and the CMBA for any other final housekeeping. No, thank you, Brad. Thank you, Professor Hoffman and Dr. England for this presentation today. Um, we hope we could shed a little bit more light on, on what has been a newsworthy and noteworthy topic um, and, and stay tuned for, for more to come as they, as they keep coming in. Thank you all for being here this afternoon and everyone have a great day.